And we're going to be going through uh, Colossians, and uh, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, to start off our lesson. And uh, if you need a copy of the lesson, they'll give it to you. Just raise your hand. Oh, uh, Mike, you want to uh, give a lesson? Okay. Appreciate it. Where are they? All right, Colossians uh, chapter 1. In uh, verse 15. Who needs a lesson? It says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And so uh, we want to consider the fact that uh, in verse 17 it says he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Verse 19, it says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And so that's where we get our title there, The Preeminence of Christ. And uh, Colossians is an important book to study. helps us to understand the preeminence of Christ. And uh, he is before all things. He can, everything consists because of him. And uh, so the preeminence of Christ. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to study tonight and have time of prayer. Pray, Lord, you would just speak to us in a special way. Uh, help us to know more about Jesus and help us understand how you must have the preeminence. And God will give you the praise and glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, uh, one of the great highlights of the epistles is the Apostle Paul's defense and confirmation of the preeminence of Christ. And uh, everything about who we are, what we believe, what we're going to experience is based on the reality of who Christ is. The greatest attack on Christianity is the defamation of Jesus Christ. If, if Christ can be discredited, if Christ can, uh, if people can turn people away from the concept that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, then they can rob us of the joy of our faith in the assurance that we have in, that heaven is our home. Uh, if it can be proven that Christ is not God, then we have no valid foundation for what we believe. Uh, either he is God eternal or he's not. And uh, the attacks always come in the realm of trying to disprove the reality of Christ preeminent. Well, one of the problems in the church at Colossae was the influence of Gnostics. Uh, Gnostics believe, you've seen your notes there, that matter was inherently evil. Thus, a holy God could not have uh, created it. Consequently, they would either abuse their flesh or simply give in to their fleshly desires. This teaching brought people to believe that Jesus Christ was less than God. So you get these concepts uh, where Jehovah's Witnesses believe that, you know, that Jesus is the good son and Satan is the bad son. Why? Because Jesus is a created being. He's lesser than God. Where does that come out of? It comes out of from this uh, Gnosticism uh, that says, oh, wait a minute, God... Uh, cannot create matter because if he creates matter and there's bad things that happen then God is not God and so uh, they, the church at Colossae had to deal with this matter of who is Christ and what is his position does he have the preeminence or doesn't he and the apostle Paul is dealing with that so chapter 1 deals with the person of God or I shouldn't say the person of Christ and letter A there, you're filling is deity. Right off the bat, he starts out dealing with de deity of Christ. And uh, when you're dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses or 
folks like that that uh, uh, really downplay the significance of Christ being God in the flesh. Uh, it's a good chapter to go to is Colossians chapter 1 to deal with the deity of Jesus Christ. Because if he's not God, then we have no salvation. And so, uh, number one there, underneath the deity, we see his deity by perfect uh, image. By perfect image, to fill in his image. And that's what he says in verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And so, uh, knowing that Jesus Christ uh, is God in the flesh, and everything that God is, is seen and experienced in Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, Philip came to Jesus, show us the Father. And Jesus told him, he said, if you see me, it suffices thee. In other words, everything that he is, is who God is. Uh, no man has seen God, but the only begotten Son hath declared him. It means revealed him and showed forth everything. Why? Because he is the perfect image of an eternal God who is spirit and came in the flesh so that man might be able to know and be able to experience a sacrifice for their sins and be able to come into the presence of God. Number two there is by perpetual presence, to fill in his presence. In uh, verse 27 of chapter 1, it says, To whom God made... Um, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And here it is. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so when you think about the deity of Christ, it's not only based on the reality that everything God is, is Christ. But it also is based on the reality that Jesus Christ is is ever with us great mystery they couldn't comprehend that they couldn't understand that that christ is in us the hope of glory is based on the fact that jesus said i'll never leave thee nor forsake thee how can he never leave us forsake or forsake us and uh, 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 because of the fact that he is god he has a perpetual presence with us and then number three in your notes there it's by prudent completeness. That's why verse 19, it says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. It means to be complete. Chapter 2 and verse 9 says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And so when you trust Christ as your Savior, you become the temple of the Holy Ghost. He dwells in us. He abides with us forever. And because of that, then we are complete. There is nothing else that we need to get of God. God gives us everything. Uh, really, the reality is, is uh, we don't need more of God. God needs more of us. Because we're the ones that hold back and don't surrender everything to the Lord. And so we see, first of all, uh, the preeminence of Christ. He starts out right off the bat with the deity of Jesus Christ. If he is not God, he doesn't have the preeminence. And so uh, there's deity. Letter B, in your notes, is priority. Priority. Notice in uh, verse 17 of uh, chapter 1, deals with this matter of having no beginning. Number one, there's no beginning. Verse 17, it says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And so there, Jesus Christ has no beginning. He has no end. And so the person of Christ is revealed in the fact that, wait a minute, before anything was here, Jesus Christ was here. You say, well, how could that be? I can't explain that. But the reality is, God has no beginning. He has no end. Jesus Christ has no beginning. He has no end. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. John chapter 1 and verse 1. You say, well, what is the beginning? Before anything existed, Jesus Christ was here and in his being. 
not only do we see the uh, priority of no beginning, but the superiority, number two there, the superiority in ranking. Because in verse 18 it says he is the head of the body of the church. The ranking, the position that he holds is that he is the head of the church. Well, why is Christ the head of the church? Because he has no beginning. Because of the fact that he is God. He is the express image of the Father in heaven. Uh, he is the one who is absolutely in, th in authority and control of all things. And number, letter C there, you go right into the next thought, the sovereignty of Christ. And so in verse 16, it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible or invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So what does that say for it? That's a sovereignty of Christ. Uh, he is in charge of, he's in control of, he is the creator of, of everything that has ever been created or ever will be. And so that means when you read the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, uh, the key word is better. And uh, it presents, Hebrews presents Christ as being greater than everything else. And so number one there, we know because he is, he's sovereign, he is greater than angels. We don't have time to look all of these cross-references up, uh, but they're there for you so you can look it up. <laughs> and so Christ is greater than the angels uh, because of his preeminence. And because of his sovereignty over all things, he's greater than the angels. Number two, he's greater than the priesthood. Uh, God established a priesthood for the Israelites to uh, offer sacrifices and praise unto their God. Uh, Jesus Christ came as our priest, as our sacrifice for our sins. He's greater than the priesthood of that of Aaron. And Hebrews chapter 7 tells us that and helps us understand that. And then he's greater, number three, greater than sacrifice. In other words, there's no sacrifice that was been offered or could be offered uh, that is greater or more uh, uh, effective to eliminate the sins of man than the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so when Paul starts out in chapter 1, he starts dealing right away with the deity of Christ and starts identifying the person of Christ uh, right away, uh, it puts the Gnostics to shame. It puts the Gnostics to, to, to silence because they cannot argue with uh, the scriptures that reveal uh, the preeminence of Christ. And so the person of Christ. Then Roman rule two is the work of Christ. And uh, as, as the person of Christ, we see his preeminence in the character traits that he possesses and the positions that he holds. But as the work of Christ, we see uh, that he is, letter A there, as the creator. He is the creator of all things. And uh, uh, verse 16, number one there, tells <laughs> us by his discretion. Notice, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and vis invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. In other words, everything that was created was by the dis discretion of Christ. In other words, if he wanted to make a tree green, that's okay. He can make the tree green. It's his decision to do so because he is the creator of all things. And this whole thing with gender dysphoria and everything else, if God created you a male, then you're a male. And that is good and that's just. Why? Because God is sovereignly in control of his creation. He is the one that created man and out of the dust of the ground. He is the one who breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul. He made them male and female. He did it at his discretion. And so when you start questioning the creation that is around us, uh, we're starting to question the reality of the person of Christ. Uh, he is the creator. He, 
You, know, you look in the mirror, you say, I don't like uh, how I look. Well, you better take it up with the Lord because he's the one that created you in, in his image. Amen. That is discretion. And then I put down here number two, by his determination. Because it says in uh, verse 17 that by him all things consist. Determination of God. Uh, determination of God is what he created. You read Genesis 1 and 2, and every day when he created, he says that it was good. And so his determination is everything that he created is good, and because it is good in his eyes, he enables it to continue on. This whole argument and frustration and and foolishness about uh, climate change and global warming and everything else. Uh, it is, uh, listen, everything that is in this world is, uh, is at the discretion of God Amen. of whether it's going to continue to exist or not. Amen. And nothing is going to be destroyed and nothing's going to be eliminated until God says it to be so. And so you say, well, how do you know that? Because of the deity of Christ, because of the person of Christ, because of the work of Christ, because of everything that we see in Scripture revealing about the world in which we live in reference to Christ. Uh, and for me to deny it or to reject it is to literally deny the preeminence of Jesus Christ. He has the right do what he wants with his creation. Amen. Why? He created it. And he is the one who sustains it. So, the work of Christ as a creator. But also, Paul identifies the work of Christ, let her be there, as a savior. As a savior. Uh, notice in verse 13 and 14 of chapter 1, there is this matter of being the savior deals with redemption. Verse 13 says, uh, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, and here it is, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And so the work of Christ is not just as the creator of the world in which we live. The work of Christ is as a savior. He is redeemer. He, his redemption is he paid the price for our sin. Uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, the wages of sin is death. Uh, sin con uh, consumes mankind, but Jesus Christ came and did a work of redemption so that we might be able to be saved. He's a great Savior. And then in verse 20 and 22, we see the number two in your notes. The reconciliation. As a Savior, he redeems us, but also as a Savior, he reconciles us. Because we're at odds with God, we're against God, but he brings us into a place of reconciliation. Notice in verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross, and by him, and here it is, to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether the, uh, they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, and here it is, to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. So unblameable, letter A is unblameable. This reconciliation, what does God do? Because he reconciles us, we cannot be blamed. It just means unblameable means a sacrifice without imperfections. So I stand before the Lord because I trust Christ's redemption, his blood that was shed. It cannot be uh, tattered or bruised or defiled in any way. Uh, I am presented as a child of God, reconciled unto God, unblameable because there are no imperfections in my salvation because of the blood of Christ. And so it's a glorious statement for 
the Gnostics that have to deal with, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, we, you know, uh, matter is dirty, matter is bad, and God created everything, he created everything, he can't, he can't be God, and, but yet, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, let's stop, because you're saying he, it's unredeemable, you're saying it, that, that it can be blamed because it's defiled. No, the reality is the precious blood of Jesus Christ well, washes away all of our sins and places us before God unblameable. Amen. The devil can't blame you or accuse you in the presence of the Lord. Why? Because Jesus is our Savior. And so not only unblameable, let her be there, is unreprovable. It means without legitimate accusation. And you know, <laughs> the world we live in now, how we put people have to do is make false accusations and people get arrested and all this, that, and the other. Well, wait a minute. There can be no accusations against you that can condemn you because of the fact that Jesus Christ has reconciled you uh, to God through the sacrifice of his own life. So we see the work of Christ as creator, as, as savior, and then, oh, um, oh, let me give you number three. I didn't give you number three. Number three is satisfaction. Number three is satisfaction. In chapter two and verse 14, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That's what Christ did. Listen, the letter of condemnation was against us because of our sin. But Jesus blotted out the ordinance that were against us, which is, was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And so uh, we're, God is satisfied with us, not because of who we are, but what Christ did. The work of Christ uh, took all the accusations and all the condemnation that was against us and removed it all because he nailed it all on the cross. So we see the personal work, person of Christ. We see the work of Christ. Then in chapter 2, the focus was on the people of Christ. Notice the people of Christ, letter A there, have full assurance. Fill in his assurance. Notice in chapter uh, 2, verse 1, says, For... Uh, would, for I would that you know what great affliction, uh, I'm sorry, great conflict I have for you, and for them of La uh, Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so full assurance. Uh, we, we, Paul's writing this because of the Gnostics that were getting in the church. It was robbing people of the assurance and confidence that they were saved. And he said, I want you to know that, wait a minute, you can be comforted with the reality that you can be sure that Jesus is your Savior. So I see a full assurance. Then I see it, let her be there, a faithful observance. And in chapter 2, in verses 4 through 7, it says, This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I, am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And so faithful observance, he's watching out for them. In verse 7, he says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And so he's just saying this, you need to observe what Christ has done in your heart. You need to hold on to that and not let go. Uh, no matter if people may come in and they may try to beguile you, they may try to deceive you, but wait a minute, Christ is still alive, and he's still the Savior, and he has redeemed your soul. And so letter C would be this, fatal influence. Now, there was many believers in the Galatian church, many believers in the church at Colossae, 
uh, that were rendered a fatal blow to their faith uh, because of the fact that those would come in and deny who Christ is and what Christ did. So this is what false religion does. Um, number one there in your notes, it, it beguiles. Just beguile, I put in there. That's what he says in verse 4. Watch out. Somebody come along and beguile you. What does that mean? Deceive or cheat you. Uh, watch out. Uh, the world is getting crazy. And there's more and more false approaches to who Christ is constantly. Watch out. You need to know what your Bible says. You need to know what you believe. And you need to be firm and steady in the reality. If somebody comes showing me something contrary to what I know in the scriptures, I'm not listening to them. We're not even going to have a debate about it. We're not going to have a discussion. So beguile. Number two is intellectual. That's what he says in verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. And so intellectual people try to, I always get tickled. People try to, you know, when somebody's caught up in error, in false doctrine, they crack me up because they try to act like they're so smart. They try to act like they're so intellectual. And they want to, they, they don't want to, they don't want to talk in a direct conversation or debate. They want to talk in platitudes. They want to run in circles. And instead of dealing with one issue, staying on the issue and getting it settled, they have to muddy the waters by trying to act intellectual, using philosophy to trip you up. And so watch out for the intellectual crowd. Watch out for those that are traditional. Number three is traditional. He says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and through vain deceit. After the traditions of men, I don't believe there's anything wrong with traditions, but your traditions override the reality of who Christ is. You're an heir. It's Christ and Christ alone. And then number four, I put down externals. Notice in verse 16, it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or a Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And so they'll use external type of religious experiences to try to trip you up and uh, try to get you off track. And uh, I don't know what I should say this now. I will. I will get myself in trouble anyway. <laughs> Here's, we, every once in a while, we've had a couple uh, Good Friday services during Easter. Uh, I don't generally have them and for years I never had any and the reason is simple you can't get three days in the grave from Friday to Sunday I believe that he was in the grave on Thursday because you know the Bible is very clear the evening and the morning were the first day and so forth and so forth so in the Hebrew calendar in the Hebrew day uh, the day starts in the evening the evening and the morning evening in the morning. So if you had the evening in the morning, he died on Friday, it would be e Friday evening and Saturday morning and Saturday evening and Sunday morning. You only got two days. So I just, you know, it's a Catholic thing. I just don't, I don't set up worship services according to cultish actions. And, uh, it, and, and so I, try, I don't I don't do that because of the fact that I don't want to get caught up and beguiled and drug in to just doing things because of the traditions of men. Uh, we've always always had it on, on, on uh, Friday. I remember when I first came here on Easter Sunday. They didn't have a church on Easter Sunday night. And it's okay. You know, choose the church that's choosing. And the, the requirement was they asked me when we were going to do our Christmas gift out. I said Easter Sunday night. <laughs> I couldn't believe some of the comments I got. Well, we've always canceled church on some Easter Sunday night. I said Easter is the biggest day of the of celebration of a Christian. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we're going to be in church. And uh, you say, what do you what do you say that for? Because it's very subtle, very subtle. 
how you get drawn into the traditions of men that may not necessarily be wrong, but they become a part of your faith and your existence as a Christian. And so you have to be careful about that. I hope I didn't get myself in trouble, but anyway. Uh, the other problem was, uh, uh, number five, uh, they lack authority. Notice in chapter two and verse 18, it says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary uh, humility and worshiping of angels. Uh, intruding into those things which you have not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And so he's saying they don't, they don't have any authority. That's the way verse 21 he says, Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. So he's saying, wait a minute, they're doing these things under the guise of the doctrines of men they have no authority to do so, so don't let them trip you up. So know what the Bible says, know why you're doing what you're doing, and don't give up. Then chapter 3 deals with putting off things for Christ. And uh, the old man, he talks about the old man. Uh, the old man means uh, to strip of the filthy, uh, a tattered garment. That's what an old man means in the scripture. And so here, here it is. Let me give you these fill-ins pretty quick. Letter A, our authority comes from Christ. That's what he says in verse 1. And uh, the authority is always questioned. Well, who gave you the right to come out here to go and go to the door? God told me to do this. That's my authority. You know, uh, I live my Christian life the way I do because it's based on what God has said. He has the authority. And so our authority comes from Christ. Letter B. Our motivation, Bill and his motivation, is Christ. Because he says, set your affections on things above, not on the things of the earth. My motivation is heaven. Uh, no letter C there. Our expectation is Christ. He says, for you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, boy, that's a good message to think on. What's your life? Um, and shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And so our motivation is Christ. Our expectation is Christ. Verse 5 through 6 is our actions. He says, now you got to put off some things in your life. And here are the things you need to put off. Uh, notice, first of all, he says in verse 5 and 6, he begins with fornication. Fornication and the filling is just any illicit sex. Anything that is unlawful. And uh, and God is the one who establishes what was lawful. So fornication. Uh, and that that would, uh, I would cover any type, heterosexual or homosexual type of sins sexually. Uh, uncleanness. Uh, the word uncleanness is filled in with this impurity. Uh, he said, "You got to put off this. You put off your fornication. You you, you put off your uh, 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 uncleanness, your impurity." Uh, number three, it says inordinate affection. That means depraved or depravity, uh, vile passions. He says, "You got to put them off." People are so gross and immoral anymore. And it, it just, they don't care what they say. They don't care what they display. And, and wait, you know, wait a minute. If you're a Christian, you put that stuff out of your life. You stop that stuff. And then evil concupiscence means a desire for the forbidden. So a desire for the forbidden. God says, thou shalt not. And we say, we, that's what I want. i got to have that. God says, you're going to be faithful to your wife. <coughs> and all of a sudden, <coughs> somebody, a lady comes walking along and is not dressed pro properly and not modest. And then you get start getting lustful thoughts. And you know, you know, that God said, thou shalt not commit adultery. You know that it's going to hurt your family if you do that, but you know that's forbidden, but you say, i got to have that. That's, that's what he's talking about. Evil concupiscence. 
Number five, covetousness uh, means just being greedy, desiring for more and more and more and more. There's nothing wrong with wanting to get ahead in life, but it cannot consume our every thought and every action. Number six there is the wrath of God is indignation, or you can say fierce anger or something like that. And so he said, you need to put all these, uh, these actions in your life have to be removed from your life. And then in verse 7 through 9, he deals with our attitudes that need to be changed. Notice uh, he deals with, number one, uh, anger. That's an internal state that produces rage. I heard a thing on the news this morning. It said uh, there was, I don't know, it's, uh, somebody blocking traffic or something up in Lakewood, and the guy got mad and jumped out of the car and maced the guy. And I was like, good night. These people are crazy. And, uh, and uh, I saw a woman yesterday, I was on my way home, and I mean, that woman liked to ram me off the road. I was riding 65 mile an hour. It's only 55 on the parkway at that spot. I'm doing 65, she went by me, I thought she was gonna run me in the ditch. And I would have said something, I was afraid she might hit me, anyway. So uh, our attitudes, anger needs to be removed. Wrath means outburst of anger. Wrath kind of carries the idea of a pot that is building up steam and all of a sudden it explodes. Uh, he says you need number three there, malice needs to be removed. That means a desire to deliberately harm others, the feelings harm. People have an attitude that they just want to hurt people, they want to hurt somebody else. Harm. Number four there, blasphemy means the feeling is slander slander someone's character. We can blaspheme God when we, we discredit God. We're blaspheming God. What are we doing? Uh, we're uh, slandering the character of God. If we say God can't save me, I'm slandering God because God said he could save me. And so uh, slander needs to be removed. Then number five, filthy communication is just uh, obscenities. You know, cussing, off-color jokes, conversations, whatever. It just has to be out of our life. And then uh, number six, lying is just telling untruths. We need to be honest people. So he says, you got to put this off. This, they were dealing with these issues. And he says, now that you're in Christ, you got to get rid of that. Then he starts talking about putting on for Christ, or putting on of Christ, which is the new man. Uh, notice how do we do that in verse 10 and 11, letter A, there's the understanding. He says, and put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Wherefore, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, uh, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. We need to understand, as a Christian, we have a very unique relationship with God in heaven, and it's based on Jesus Christ. So that means because I'm in Christ, I need to put this stuff, my actions and bad attitudes, out of my life. But I also have to put on who Jesus Christ is. Well, how do I do that? He says, according to knowledge, according to understanding. How can I live like Christ or for Christ or with Christ if I don't know who he is and I don't understand how he's going to work in my life? So putting on Christ. And then in verse 12 through 15, I just let her be there. I called it the caring. Because he says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, I mean, it's just, those verses are just dealing with this thing of having a caring heart. That's why verse 14 says, above all these things, put on charity. And so just being willing to do that. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to get through all these things. I got too many things to say. We'll pick this up uh, next week as we go into Colossians. We'll finish up Colossians and then go right into 1 Thessalonians. So we're going to be starting on that last page and just thinking about the preeminence of Christ. How can all of this take place in our life?
is through the preeminence of Christ. And uh, we've got to give him first place. And uh, we can, listen, our lives are not our own. We've been bought with a price. So let's live our life uh, putting Jesus number one and first place. And uh, I'm preaching uh, for Jimmy Powerly on Sunday, and I'm preaching on the family. And uh, one of my points is that, uh, in reference to the family, is that my in my family, God has first place. And we and that's what Colossians is all about. It's about God having first place. And it's not fitting God into our schedule. It's making everything that I am and that my schedule in my life, I fit it into the reality of who Christ is, how I live for him, how I worship him. And we look at that next week about the worship of Christ. All right, we need to pray together. i, I got to get the prayer sheet. Is there anything we need to add to? Anything we need to add to the prayer sheet tonight before we go to order in prayer? Antonio. Uh, my mom has been having just some health issues. She's got some, some blood work done, feeling lightheaded, and just a few things that, that worry her. Um, they're waiting on results of that to figure out what it is. Okay. Um, but if you remember, she just had a baby yeah. just six mm -hmm. months ago. So um, going to the doctor and just different things like that. They, Sure. Yeah. Pray for Antonio's mother. Had some blood work done, not feeling well. Uh, don't know what's going on. Let's pray the doctor will find out real quick. Is somebody else there now? Yeah, Mary. Uh, pray for my uncle in Barbados. Uh, he's got some new um, chemo treatment tomorrow. And uh, just pray that it goes well. He doesn't do well okay. with the drug. All right. Pray for. Uh, uh, Miriam's uh, uncle in Barbados and uh, doing chemo tomorrow. Let's so pray that out goes well. Amen. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. issues that they'll be able to find out what's going on there and uh, I know God can step in and intervene with that Praise God. anyone else? Pam um, I believe we've come to an agreement with our landlady about the purchase of a home that we've been okay. renting um, as for um, the Lord's will I'm Lord willing tomorrow morning I'll have a definitive answer but okay. it's whatever the Lord wills with that sure alright so let's pray for Pam and Art, with their, their home, trying to work out the deal with their purchase of that, and God give them wisdom. Anything else? Yes, go ahead. Just pray for a successful surgery Tuesday. Okay. All right, pray for Greg, for surgery on Tuesday. All right, okay. Anything else? All right, remember Sunday we'll be in the gym for church services. And next Wednesday we'll be in the back team room, the old team room, uh, for Wednesday night. Because uh, they're supposed to be here Monday morning, start uh, sanding and restaining the pews. So pray we'll get here safely and all that good stuff. A lot of stuff that needs to be done. Amen. All right, God bless you for being here tonight. And let's pray for a while. Amen. I appreciate that.